Good morning, and welcome to Prayer the Adventure again. This last week, again, we had some difficulties with recording. So I'm going to be recording the first, the, the teaching part of this session, and then I'm going to be including the recording that we do have of some of the discussion afterwards so that you can see that. But today's focus is going to be on the subject of meditation. So I hope you enjoy this message. Prayer of the Adventure, a six-step program for the developing the habit of prayer. Today we'll be talking about meditation. Before we um, go any further, let me take some time and talk to you about my personal journey in the matter of, of slowing down. I was a pastor for 40 years. When I was in my mid-40s, I was at a church that I always wanted to have. I was ambitious. I wanted uh, to go to larger churches, and I was able to go to one of the largest churches in our denomination as pastor, and um, uh, I, at the time, thought I was doing great. I've always been uh, ADD and, and excited in doing a great many things. And I carried that same drive into that church. It was a church of over 700 people, and I was its only pastor. While I was there, I was raising three teenage daughters with my wife, and they were going through the usual teenage problems and trying to be a good father. I also started working on a doctorate in preaching at the time. And after I was about five years into it, I started realizing that my energy and enthusiasm were draining out, that it was like wading through molasses to go to work every day. And eventually it led me to begin to question my calling and then it even to question to a degree my faith. And so I went to a, a friend of mine recommended a counselor who specialized in pastors and pastors' families, and particularly in work-related problems. So I went to her, and before I saw her, she had me fill out a questionnaire. And when I walked in the room, before she even said hello, she looked at me and she said, this screams burnout. You are getting burned out, and you need to take off time right now. She thought I ought to take three months off. I knew I couldn't do that. I talked to my wife. I talked to counselors that I knew. I talked to friends who knew me well, and they all recommended at least six weeks. Uh, in the end, I finally took three weeks, but I took it off as medical leave. And when I went to the doctor, my blood pressure was just through the roof. I didn't know what had happened to me. I didn't understand that it's how easy it is for a person to burn out in their lives. And I said to myself, well, I'm a person who prays. I pray. Why doesn't that help? But my prayer life had become uh, purely perfunctory. It was, it was just a few minutes a day of of going through a prayer list. And even I could even rationalize myself into saying that, well, since I pray through the day, do I really need that time of prayer in the morning? I didn't learn to concentrate and focus. And as a result of that, I just flat ran out of steam. And that happens, I think, to a lot of us. Because we don't know how to slow down, we find eventually we work ourselves into a frenzy. It happened to me. And let me tell you, I've heard the expression, it's better to burn out than to rust out. It is not true. Burnout is real, and it's serious, and you have to be careful about it. So my personal journey about learning how to slow down and pray is, it is very personal. And it's, this section is very meaningful to me for that reason. So let's look at it. When I was in my burnout time, I went to the beach and walked along the beach every day for two weeks. And as I did, God gave me this psalm, Psalm 131, and it says this. It says, My heart is not proud, Lord, 
My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Notice those words in there. I have calmed and quieted my soul. The psalmist suggests that it's up to us to calm and quiet our soul. And when we do that in the presence of God, it becomes a very beautiful thing. It's like, like a mother holding her baby. Can you imagine what it'd be like to be a baby being held in your mother's arms or your father's arms? You don't have a care in the world. All you feel are those, that comforting help. You don't have to think out your problems. You don't have to worry because you know you're in mama or daddy's arms. That's the feeling that this psalm conveys about our relationship to God, that it is curling up in daddy's arms and feeling his love around us. To learn to quiet ourselves, to learn to meditate, is to learn to curl up in daddy's arms. The word meditate means to focus or think deeply about something, to put our attention upon that. Meditation is calming and quieting your soul. It is learning to be still so that we can enter into the presence of God. Meditation is like, picture it this way. Do you know, have you ever driven a big truck? You've certainly been around them on the road. One of the things, if you've ever driven a big truck that you know, is that you cannot stop it quickly. That a truck must slow down before it can stop and change directions. And the heavier the load, the longer it takes the truck to slow down. The heavier the load of our heart, the harder it is to slow down and pay attention to God as well. We come to prayer with all kinds of worries and all kinds of stress at our hearts. And then we wonder how come we've got so many wandering thoughts in prayer. It's because we haven't taken the time to slow down so that we can focus upon God. Meditation is how we turn around. And before we turn around, we have to come to a stop. We have to learn to slow down so that we can know God and focus our attention wholly upon him. Let me give you a little bit about what the Bible says about slowing down. Habakkuk 2.20 says this, The Lord is in his holy temple, and let all the earth be silent before him. What is the temple of God? The temple of God is our hearts. God is in our hearts. And when we enter into that, si that place in prayer, we need to learn to silence our hearts and our minds so that we can see the Lord in that temple of our inner, inner self. Job 33, 31 through 33 says this, Pay attention, Job, and listen to me. Be silent, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak up, for I want you to be cleared. But if not, then listen to me. Be silent and I will teach you wisdom. Be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Collect all your heart together, and then you will find God. Now, there are three sides to meditation. I'm going to talk about these sides and how they need to come together to be silent before God. Three parts of our nature. Meditation is di learning to direct the will. It is stilling the mind. And it is using the imagination. Let's talk about it as regards to the will to begin with. The will, the imagination, and the intellect all come together into a single still whole. What does it mean to direct the will? It means to make a choice to focus on God. The part of ourselves that is the most in touch with our will, that can be affected by the will, our will more than any part, is our bodies. We understand that the will must order the body to be still. So we do that. We command our bodies to be still so that they can focus upon God. 
And people say, well, there's so many things to worry about. There's so many things I need to do. How can I be still? Well, think of this. The will chooses to stop thinking about our worries. Think about a woman on a hike. She's going to those far hills that you see in the distance. But she makes a choice along the way. She says, for this moment, even though that is my ultimate destination, I don't have to go there. I can stop for five minutes and rest. And that's what she does. When we stop in our journeys to, stop, to, to spend time with God, we're not denying our worries. We're not really stopping our worries. We're simply laying them aside for a while so that we can catch our breath. Prayer is the place we catch our breath. And we rest so that we can go on to that hard things. But in order to do that, we must stop striving for them. There's a concept that comes not from Christianity, but from uh, somewhere else called mindfulness. But it is found in our lives. It means to put aside our past, future, and future and focus on what is happening here and now. It is learning to live in the precious present. The Bible talks about this in several places. For example, in Ecclesiastes 3.1, it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. You know the rest of it, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to, to get and a time to take, you know, to, take to, to give away and a time to receive, etc., etc. What it says is, in every life we have seasons, and during the day we have those seasons. There is a season for sleep. There is a season for eating. There is a season for being still before the Lord. Know the right season and appreciate it. Know that time of stopping and stillness so that you can do other things. Matthew 6, 31 through 40, 34, Jesus talks about the same principle. He says, don't worry about what we shall eat or what we shall drink or what we shall wear. For the pagans are after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. In each day has enough trouble of its own. Think about this day, this moment, what you need to be doing this moment. And what we need to be doing this moment is not worrying about whether or not we're going to have a job tomorrow. It's, it's not worrying about what's happening with our kids on the other side of the continent. What really is important right now is to think about God and to think about his needs. The other things can wait. This is now. We're listening to God. Ecclesiastes 8.15, so I commend the enjoyment of life. Because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil and all the days that God has given them under the sun. What Ecclesiastes is saying is concentrate on what you're doing right now, right at this moment. And if we're resting before God, let's rest. We still the body. We still through the will. And now we still the intellect by letting God do our thinking for us. You know, in, in our relationship to God, we know that we have many problems. Our lives have many problems with us today. But what we forget is that they are not our problems. We worry about our kids because we think our kids are still our responsibility. They're not our responsibility. They're God's. We think, well, I've got to have plans. I've got to, be, I've got to think things through. No, you don't. Because eating and drinking, what you put on, what you wear, where you sleep, your future, they're real problems. They're just not yours. Let God do the thinking for him. You be a sheep, not a shepherd. Instead, listen for the still, small voice of what God wants you to do right now. One of the best examples of this is in King, 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13, in the story of Elijah. Elijah was a burned-out prophet. He had fought the battle, the great battle, battle with the priest of Baal. He was successful, but he was wiped out. He was stressed out. He was burned out. God told him to go to Mount Sinai and sit in a cave 
And here's what he told him to do. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. There was a great wind so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was the earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of sheer silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And there came a voice saying to him, saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? See, Elijah didn't hear God until the silence came. Then he heard God. When I first read this, I sort of rebelled against it. I said, Elijah was a prophet. He, every word that came out of his mouth was God's word. He spoke God's word. Surely he heard God there. Yes, he did. But those of us who preach and those of us who teach have to learn that even though we may speak God's words, they're not our words. And that sometimes we get our words and God's words mixed up. And sometimes the only time that we can hear God, truly hear him, is to stop preaching, is to stop teaching, is stop trying to figure things out with our own minds and just be in God's presence. The earthquake, storm, and wind represent our distractions from prayer. Our minds are busy and will not stop. And the only way to hear God's voice is to still the storms of our minds, to let our minds be still and then hear them. We need to choose not to pay attention to the problems and the worries of the moment, the storms of today, so that we can, we can pay attention to the voice of God. All right, I'm going to go through you what I call a three-step pattern process of focusing on God. And the first part of that process is simply this. We're going to get in position. You see, the position of your body is very important. I remember I told you that our wills, the one thing that we command more than any other part is our bodies. We can choose the position of our body. So when we go into stillness, when we go into meditation, the first thing you want to do is to choose a good position for it. Choose a prayerful position. Now, for some people, that may be lifting your hands in the air, folding your hands in front of you. It may be kneeling. It could be sitting. It could be prone. It could even be a yoga position. None of that matters as long as you have a specific position. And when your body goes into that position, you're saying to yourself, now is the time I'm going to be still. And your body reminds you of that because it's in the right position for it. Close your eyes and assume a prayerful position. And the posture does not matter. Which one it is does not matter as long as you're comfortable, alert, and easy in it. Once you're in that position, and this may surprise you, focus on your body. Why? Because you just set your body in a prayerful position. So think about your body. Think about the parts of your body and relax each one of them one by one. Release the tensions of your mind and your body by relaxing your body parts one by one. Your feet, your legs, your, your thighs, your hands, your arms, your torsos. Now, why do I say to do this? Why is that important? Well, it's important to you because your body is the one who tells, that really reveals where your heart is. Have you ever had somebody that you just didn't like being around, and when you got around them, you could just feel it in your stomach, that gut in your stomach? Or if you've ever been in a difficult meeting and felt come away and felt the tightness in your neck about that? But your body is reacting to the thoughts and attentions of your mind. So you want to let go of those. You let go of your stress. Let go of your tension by letting go of the stress and the attention that you feel in the parts of your body. And then focus on your breathing. You know how they say when you're angry or you're upset, they say, take a deep breath. Well, that is very important. Focus your breathing slowly. Inhale. Exhale. Take it about three seconds at least for each cycle of a of, of breathing. Inhale. One, two, three. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. 
over and over and feel the tensions being released from your body. Focusing our body and meditation draws attention away from our worldly thoughts. It dissipates our, atten our tensions in our bodies. And once we've done that, then take and do short breath prayers to help yourself focus. Now, what's a breath prayer? A breath prayer is a prayer that is short enough. It may be a scripture, it could be a song, it could be a prayer, whatever. But it's short enough to say in a three second breath interval. Inhale, exhale, slowly over and over. Use your breathing to focus your attention on God by using a breath prayer or a breath word or a breath chorus. Let me give you some examples of one I use. Here's a Trinity prayer that I frequently use. Our Father, creator of all things, thank you for your universe. I'll pray it this way. Our Father, creator of all things, inhale, thank you for your universe. Exhale. Holy Jesus, Son of God, inhale. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Exhale. Holy Spirit, eternal flame, inhale. Fill me with your love. Exhale. Repeat this over and over again. Don't try to think about what it means. Just simply say it. Just simply do it until your mind and your body and your will start flowing into each other and start experiencing that stillness. Here's a good one that I got from Richard Rohr. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Or another breath prayer. Jesus, be near me. Jesus, release me. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus. You see, it really doesn't have to be more than just one word, Jesus. Anything that calls our attention to God's presence and helps us to still our thoughts and our minds. Continue in God's presence for several minutes. And when you're finished, open your eyes and continue deeper into the presence of God. Third, we can focus by using our imaginations. Imaginations is simply means imagery, using imagery to focus our attention on God. Take a person who's painting a painting. They're looking at a landscape, and they're more than just studying it with their minds. They're reacting with it with their hearts, and all that their minds and their hearts are goes into the image they are painting. Well, when we're looking at God with our minds and with our hearts, using our imagination as a way of pa painting an image and then painting that image, it becomes so much more real to us than if we just thought about it. We feel it. We experience it through our imagination. Our imagination is not always accurate. It doesn't have to be. It is simply a way that our hearts and our minds can come together around the reality of God. Let me give you a couple of examples. One is an image of heaven. Imagine yourself in heaven. What would be the sights and the sounds and the smells, the smell of incense, the sight of the ra radiance of God, the sound of angel choirs? Try to use your senses to picture all of that. Now imagine Christ on his throne, and you're releasing the problems of the day to him. And now imagine yourself sitting there silently and releasing one by one your tensions and your problems into his presence as you sit in silence and awe before him. Just sit there for a few minutes, imagining that throne of God. And if you have trouble doing it, read Isaiah 6, because that's what Isaiah does there. And it's marvelous. Or another one is to imagine the image of Christ. You're in your prayer position. You're in your prayer place at your homes. And suddenly you hear footsteps and Christ walks in. He reaches out and he puts his hands in your hands. What do the footsteps sound like? What do the hands of a carpenter feel like? 
and he looks into your eyes. At first he sits there and does nothing except look into your eyes. And then finally he asks, my child, what would you like to say to me? Well, what would you say? Use your imagination to picture Christ there before you. Another way of using our imagination is what's called imaginative Bible study. That's where we put ourselves into a particular Bible passage. Read a passage of the Bible and imagine yourself as one of the characters in that passage. What do you see? Use your senses again. What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel? What emotions, particularly, do you feel if you were that person in the Bible? Let's use that on Psalm 23. Imagine yourself a sheep. What does a sheep hear, see, smell, touch, and taste? What's it like to stand out there in the middle of the pasture? What comes? What, what does it feel like to have the dirt beneath your feet? How, as a sheep, would you feel towards the shepherd? Keep in mind, a sheep is very short-sighted. They can only see the sheep in front of them or the back of their shepherd. What would it be like to be so utterly dependent upon God? like a sheep is upon his master. How would your walk with Jesus be different if you had that same level of trust that a sheep has to have for the shepherd? So this week, I have a couple of exercises I want you to try. One would be to do the imagination exercises that I mentioned. And by the way, there are more imagination exercises on my YouTube video side. You can find them there. I want you to prepare for prayer each day by meditation, slowing down. Don't rush into prayer, but take a moment to compose and quiet your soul. Sit in that comfortable, prayerful position. Focus on your breathing. Use breath prayers, scriptures, a short song or a word to focus your mind upon God. Try not to think of anything but the goodness of God and of His presence. And whenever wandering thoughts come in, and they will, Go back to that prayer, that breathing prayer that I talked to you about. Or one word, Jesus, Father, God, to bring your heart back to God. Close with thankfulness. Exercise number two is to try an imaginative reading of a scripture. Uh, Mark 10, the story of blind Bartimaeus. Matthew 8, Jesus stilling the storm, or maybe Exodus 3, Moses in the burning bush. You choose it and try to put yourself in there like you're filming a movie with all the sights, the sounds, the smells of what that would be like and imagine it. And think about these two questions. You might want to stop the video and just look at them for a moment. How difficult or easy is it to set a regular time of quiet? And during that time of quiet, what brings you the greatest benefit? Well, that's all for today. Keep in mind the pattern we're going by. Meditation, slowing down. Next week, praise, seeing God for who he is. Thanksgiving, recognizing what he's done. Confession, agreeing with him about ourselves. Petition, telling him what we want. And practicing the presence of God. So, that's our lesson for today. I've included in here some of the discussion we had when we did it live last Tuesday so that you can hear a little bit of it. And uh, I would encourage you to join us next week as we talk about praise. Uh, thank you. God bless you. Yeah. Well, my brain doesn't think so. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to put that out of your mind a lot of times. It really is. Um, but like I said, the, the key to it is to just let it come and let it go. Yeah. And realize I don't have to do anything about it. There, see, that's where we get in trouble with distractions is we think when we hear a distraction, we have to do something. Like one of my big distractions is my dog. Um, because when I sit down in the morning and I have and I have 10 minutes of contemplative prayer, which is just what I described here about slowing down meditation. You know, I'll set a timer for 10 minutes. I'm going to spend 10 minutes at it. Inevitably, my dog wants out. <laughs> or in and out, and then in again. 
You know? Well, I finally figured out that when the dog is barking at the door wanting to get in, I just tell myself, that's not my dog. <laughs> I don't know whose dog that is, but it's not mine. Nobody's can worry about that one. Um, and in 10 minutes, you know, in 15 minutes, it'll be my dog. But right now, he's just a beast. I'm just going to let him go. <laughs> and it can wait. <laughs> yeah, because there's this urge in me that says, I got to go fix this right now because I got the same thing with kids. You know, when kids start crying stuff, sometimes you just have to say to them, honey, you know, I love you. I'll, I'll deal with that in 10 minutes. <laughs> Try that with a five year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grandma, grandma. grandma. <laughs> it really is. But, you know, I, I don't want to make light of that. <laughs> Been there, done that. That's really good. So the other part of that question was, um, how do you how do you bring yourself around the stillness? Is anybody is there a particular thing that helps you deal with that still? You know, to to get into that still place in your prayers. I think like you were saying, the breathing, that helps me out yes. because uh, I've struggled with anxiety. And yeah. one of the one strategies that the counselor told me was like the breathing and things yeah. like that. And so I, I, I try to make a conscious effort to, to start out like that. Uh, well, actually, when I, if I feel like an anxiety attack's coming on, I'm like, well, like you said, recognize that it's happening instead of not. Yeah. And then, you know, the deep breaths and holding it. And it's amazing how that will. I mean, it just, it, you know, does. it slows you down. Yeah. 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 One thing I've discovered recently, as far as in my meditation, I, um, yeah, I, I, people would always tell me about the bodily position. And uh, I was a little skeptical about that, frankly. I mean, I think, well, you know, we can pray in any position. Right. Lately, I have been purposely assuming a particular position. And I'm amazed how much the difference it makes. Hmm. Because when I get into that position, my mind is, you know, first of all, it's very comfortable, sort of like a lotus position or whatever. Mm -hmm. Find out that as I'm praying in that position, that I'm telling myself, this is the time of prayer. This is the position mm -hmm. When I when I have when I'm still and when I'm in prayer, and my body begins telling my mind and my heart, yes, you're praying because you're in the right position to pray. Mm -hmm. um, other, you know, the uh, the whole thing with crossing yourself, it's another one of those things that reminds you that you're in the presence of God. The putting your hands together and praying this way, lifting your hands in the air and praying that way, is all different ways your body tells you you're. You're praying. Yes. Yeah. And that really helps. Um, you know, my uh, my background for 40 years as a pastor was in Presbyterian churches, and Presbyterians are the least bodily aware people that I know. <laughs> I think it's all in the head, you know? And when you if you lift your hand and worship, they look at you and say, What are you crazy? You know. <laughs> but it's their fault. The body often leads the hearts and the mind in prayer. So if you learn to accept a body prayer, it really helps the rest of you to pray and keep your focus. So mm -hmm. Just a, a pointer that helped me. Um, a lot of people, you know, will tell me that they love to listen to Christian music. Mm -hmm. that worked great. You know, whatever can bring you around to seeing Jesus is a useful thing to do. Sometimes saying prayers, particular prayers, um, helps. You know, the Lord's Prayer. All of that helps. All you're really doing is to try to bring your mind and your heart and your emotions to focus upon the presence of Christ. That's what you're trying to do. And any way that you can do that helps you to move on. Now, now next week, we're going to move on into the parts of prayer. We're going to start talking about praise and thanksgiving and what comes after that. This is the doorway in. To learn to be still and focus upon God is the doorway to go the rest of the way we go. So, anybody else want to add anything to that? I I uh, just like to say, uh, last night I was around about three o'clock in the morning. The Holy Spirit He visited me, mm. and I was asleep. I was awoke. 
And uh, he told me to contact all my children and tell them not to take shortcut during this crisis of Corona. Hmm. A, a lot of times we will, uh, well, the reason why I, I, I believe more or less than other, uh, my youngest son, he, he lives in New Orleans. Hmm. And that is a hot spot for the corona. And he only not only that, but he works at the hospital. Wow. And uh, he he was letting me know that there's different things that they have to put on and before they will let him go on these different floors. He said one of the floors is full of nothing but corona patients. Huh. And he he has to go on that floor for about 20 minutes. And it, it just dawned on me, uh, I, you know, a lot of times we'll take shortcuts in, in preparation ourselves. Mm-hmm. Well, we might say, well, I don't need to put on my gloves or we don't need the, the hazmat suit on or something like that. But he's told me to tell them, don't take no shortcuts. Mm-hmm. Put on the whole, whatever it is that he's supposed to be doing, do it. Mm-hmm. And... I only, I, and that stuck with me and this morning. Um, I sent a, a strong text message down in New Orleans with mm-hmm. all this information on it. And I hope that he got it and, and obeys all of it. That, and not only to him, but I, I, I sent it to all the rest of my kids because I got one in Raleigh, I got two in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I said, well, I might well send the same message to them too because. They's away from me, and I'm not up there with them. But they're all grown, but they still need to. Sometimes we need to be reminded. Mm-hmm. We need to be reminded. We do. I'm hoping and praying that they will take this to heart. Don't take shortcuts because this coronavirus thing is a very serious thing. Yes. And a lot of people are losing their lives. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um. So let me give you. Let me know that we gotta be obedient. Yes. We gotta be obedient to the word. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me go back to just a moment and uh, just share a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, the next steps uh, will be: we talked about meditation. Next week, we're going to talk about praise, which is seeing God for who He is. Then we'll talk about Thanksgiving recognizing for what he's done, confession, agreeing with him about ourselves, petition, practicing the presence of God. So that's where we're going to be going with it. And next week we'll be on praise. So just wanted to give you all a little background on that. Now, before we finish here, um, over here in the chat area, if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and write them in on the chat area and we'll pray for them. So that way we can all look and see what they are. So if you've got one, just over there and we'll pray for it okay um so what's wrong with your anime? I, I would like you to remember if you will my daughter whose husband lost her his job when this all started and uh god's taking care of them but i would appreciate your prayers for him his name is mitch her name is molly she has been very busy she's working online uh, and one of the things she's having to do is to help process these small business loans, and they're, they've been kind of a mess right now. So just keep her in your prayers um, because she could really use it. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you and for your prayers. And uh, I think I'm probably going to have to set up another um, another teaching time sometime this week because there's so many people that got blocked out by passwords. I, I did not expect that. So we'll have to see what we can do with that. So, um, but if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and write them in. Uh, So, right. Okay. I don't see it yet. Oh, here we go. Okay, from the Wheelands, Franz and Angela. She's older in an assisted living and wants to go home. 
but she'll never be able to go home. Her name is Angela. So let's remember to pray for Angela. Are there any others? I'm just a slow typer. Oh, okay. It's not faster to talk than type. So, <laughs> yeah. I like to request a prayer for my son, especially down in uh, right. Louisiana, down in New Orleans. Sure will. Robert, would you write his name in over there so we can see it? Okay. All right. Yeah, we definitely want to pray for him. One of our friends, uh, we found out Friday, both of her parents have COVID. They're in New York. And uh, so I want to keep that in. I remember their name. Her name is Sophie. I don't know her parents' name. So, okay. Regina Dean Thompson. Regina Dean Thompson. Reginald. Reginald Thompson. I'll type it in. Okay, Reginald Thompson. Okay, pray for Alicia. I work in a military base. Okay, Alicia. You're on a military base. What's happening on a military base, Alicia? Well, you know they're not saying because they don't want the in they don't want the enemy to know what's going abroad because they don't want to know want them to know that um our defenses, you know, are weakened, so they can't really report what's going on on the base. I got you. But there is a lot of uh now this uh today when I went to work, it's mandatory that you wear a mask. Mm. And then some of my clinics are going to two to three days a week. Wow. wow. But they're still telling us we'll be paid um 40 hours a week because you know this yeah. is something we can't uh, right. we can't um help, but right. still it's still a lot of people are concerned and they don't know where to turn, but right. I keep telling them. Uh, one guy, uh, when he left the other day, he said, "Nothing's out there but germs and plenty of Jesus." So I keep telling them, <laughs> "Jesus is out there. Jesus is everywhere, just like that Corona." So absolutely. <laughs> wow, that's great. Wow. Well, let me let me uh, go ahead and have a prayer for these uh, needs, Lord. We lift up. Those that have been mentioned, uh, and Angela, we pray for her. It's very difficult in her assisted living facility right now. Uh, it's hard for all of them in assisted living facilities. Yeah. Pray for Reginald Thompson. We thank you, Lord, for him working in that hospital down in New Orleans. But, Father, I pray that you keep him safe. In the name of Jesus. You help Robert to be assured in his heart and mind that God will keep him and watch over him. I pray for Alicia and her work in the military base, and I pray for our soldiers and all of them working there. And I pray, Lord, that you will uh, bring healing, not only to them, but to the whole land. I pray for Michael, who's looking after his ailing parents and having to do all the everything for them. Heavenly Father, touch them as well. Uh, and I also lift up my, my son-in-law, Mitch, and my daughter, Molly, in this time when there's great stress in this family. Lord, we pray for those who yes. not make it tonight, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will help and direct them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, y'all, thank you for being here tonight. Yes. We're, we're going to go again next week. Okay? I will see you next week. It was good. It was good. 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 And by all means, the same password that got you in this week will get you in next week. Okay. Okay. Just say, all right. Well, God bless you, and we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.